Hey everybody, thank you for joining us again today. I'm Scott Hunter, the writer and director of Skin on Skin, the rise and fall of the world's largest furrier. Today I am in the studio with the film's narrator and probably the person whose voice was heard more than anybody else's throughout the entire film, Michael Eidlis. Hey, welcome. That unto itself is very scary, but I appreciate the opportunity. And that's what it was, so... Um, so thank you for joining us today. So let's start with, um, you did a great job in this, and it's something that you've always enjoyed since you were a little kid, since I've known you since you were a little kid. So tell us uh, what led Michael Eidlis to Behind the Microphone. Well, that's interesting because growing up, and it's really kind of a long story, but I know we have time, so I'll share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> when, even I met you when I was eight, okay? When I was seven, my sister Bonnie, who is acknowledged in the credits here, um, was dating this DJ from the Brown University radio station, WBRU. His name was Cowboy Coogan. And he took me to the studio. I was seven years old, never been in a, obviously never had been in a radio station before. And he started talking to me in the studio when he was like, so what do you like? How do you like this place? I'm like, it's rotten. You know, just being a little spoiled brat. And he was like, well, where are we? I'm like, in the, at WBRU. And he was like, yeah, but where are we? And I'm like, Providence. He's like, yeah, but where? I'm like, Rhode Island. And I'm just being a little brat, you know. And as it turns out, he cut that all up. And I became WBRU's legal ID at the top of the hour for like three years. And ever since I kept hearing myself on the radio, I was like, this is what I want to do, you know. So I did it, and I went and I went to college for it, and I did, you know, local college radio. I did top 40 radio, and I had an opportunity at one point to, making a long story short, to go into the record industry. And it was a big decision for me because when I graduated college, I was either going to be, you know, taking a full-time job at the record company or taking a job doing overnights at a place called WTOS in Vermont which stood for Top of Sugarloaf, Top of Sugarloaf Mountain. And me, being the trying-to-be-mature guy, said, well, you know, being a DJ isn't a long-term career. Being a record guy, I can do this the rest of my life. And what do you know, here we are 30, 40 years later, and I'm back in radio again doing the voice stuff. It's really a wild story. Who doesn't love a rags-to-riches story? But... A rags to riches to collapse story? There were two Evans Furs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story, and the one that tumbled from that peak decades later. But that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is what happened in between. They live the American dream and they let a lot of people come in and live it with them. And it was a wonderful story until it wasn't. Coming from a, a generation that was so driven and willing to work 18 hours a day to be successful, there aren't that many people like that anymore. Like they created something out of whole cloth and he help kings and queens around the world with their fur coats. That was the era, uh, I would say, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores. Genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger non-existent parenting and so they didn't learn how to cope with stresses. And I just look at the damage that my father created and the things that he has said. But it certainly caused a, a significant rift in the family and families and, and you know, a number of us didn't communicate with each other for a long time. You marry into the family, you marry into the business because that is your life. Clearly, 
there were problems. However, what you learn in the music industry and in promotions in the music industry really helps you behind the microphone, doesn't it? Very much so, because my job was getting records played on the radio, so my job all day, every day, was talking to radio, visiting to radio, listening to radio, and I really, you know, got a broad national perspective of, you know, how to be good on the air. So, uh, tell, let's, let's cut to the film a little bit now. Tell me, uh, when I first approached you with this project, what you thought, and uh, how this all led, led to us talking here today. Honestly, I thought it was a brilliant idea because I had known, obviously, about Evan Spurs and your family to a certain extent. But having voiced and narrated this whole thing, man, there is so much I didn't know. It, It's really a fascinating story, man. I was really, I hope you can hear it in the narration, but I was involved, you know, I was interested. It's, it's an unbelievable story, and I think it's a credit to you and a service to your family to get this out there and let people know, like, what really happened. Because, as you say, money doesn't care who has it, and there's obviously a crazy story behind this, you know? Yeah, that's a great point. So, so, but, but like you said, uh, the, the more you got into it, the more we did it, even though we didn't record everything in order or whatnot, but you find yourself being reeled into it, don't you? Very much so, you know, and, it's, and there was so much that I didn't know and I was almost a little bit mad at you because like, you're like my oldest friend. I've known you for literally 51 years now. And I'm kind of, you may remember the call. I'm like, how do I not know all this, you know? I knew pieces. I knew about your sister, obviously. I knew a lot, but not to the extent that, that we got into this. Uh, my grandmother Thelma almost seemed resigned that these are the kinds of things that happened. In fact, her husband, my grandpa Harold, when I went and delivered the news to them, literally said these things happen and it was the comment and they had looks of people who had been there before and you know what i think that's part of the point of the film right it's all stuff that's buried under the rug and perpetually you know and so that's, to me it was the opportunity to start to bring it out a little bit it's brilliant it must have been hard to put it all together how did you get the photos how did you get the commercials, how did you get all your family to say, yes, I'll do this? It sort of snowballed as the thing went on. With this, people got involved. Uh, everybody did a little bit with photos. Uh, uh, the biggest charge of photos I actually had that uh, my grandmother Thelma uh, uh, carried, slept around. Well, they didn't move that much, but she had her whole life. And then, and then I slept the stuff around with me. You know, as my ex-wife and I moved around and, you know, you sit there every time you move, wanting to move this shit to the dump pile, but you just can't. And finally comes the day when this stuff becomes extremely valuable. So I had about 50 percent of it and everybody else has contributed. And um, you know, people are continuing to contribute as we start to um, record part two and three while you and I are sitting here talking about part one. Um, but but yeah, so everybody helped out. Julius and Rose Meltzer went forward with the belief that their son's death was an accident. And this setback rocked the family during a time when Brother A.L. and Herman's Evans Furs was skyrocketing to the top of the industry. Those Meltzer kids obviously weren't taught how to cope or how to parent or, or you know, relationship skills were really lacking and that got passed down. DNA really plays a role in in any you know in anyone's well-being. All I know is that he had a photographic memory. He was brilliant, and the family loved him. So she was always you know, like I was her little doll. She loved, but she was very interesting and fun and vivacious. All of his grandchildren wrote reports on Nuremberg at some point in school. You know, someone would always have an assignment, interview some relative about something. Nonchalantly would toss a question out and the, the beads of sweat 
we're pouring off as he's trying to answer Uncle Bernie's question. A lot of people live in fear that, you know, oh my God, is that going to happen to me? In the end, a lot of people got hurt. A lot of customers got got hurt because their coats weren't there. And, you know, it was it was just a bad thing. Not for nothing, we were supposed to be life. You know what I mean? We were following, you know, that suit. I'll never forget it. He's here, this dinosaur, you know, toy dinosaur on the table. And he says, this is what Evans is. And you know what he happened to these dinosaurs? That wasn't what the legacy that he wanted for himself. He didn't want to wake up and smell the coffee. So he just, you know, he did the things that he enjoyed doing. Well, it's good. And it's interesting that Thelma had the bulk of it, because, and it makes sense, right? Because it's like she had this stockpile of photos out, so there was no way that these were going to get lost. Right, right. And she's the pseudo mother of them all, so you know, she she right. did what she had, what she had from her parents and from her like. So she she had letters that you see in the film. She has. Uh, photos that nobody else in the family has uh that, you know some of the famous photos like of her brother with uh, with uh, Yitzhak Rabin and uh, David Ben-Gurion and the Duchess of Windsor and you know I mean cra crazy crazy things for for back then so but like I said I yeah, but you, well with, yeah no I don't know me to interrupt you but that was the other thing I didn't really recognize Evans as an international brand I knew it was a heavy national brand but when I start seeing pictures of duchesses and all these people from overseas, it's like, this was really like an international phenomenon. A.L. and his brothers and my grandmother and the family, they created something out of nothing. They, they created something out of whole cloth. And, there, and, and it went a public company. And he helped kings and queens around the world with their fur coats. You know, part of it is... Um... Uh, you know, as they became the largest in the U.S., that started to have heft around the country, you know, like in a lot of businesses. So um, so let me ask you. So um, you came up with a couple of things that actually ended up in the film, too. As we got into the middle of the, snow, of the, of the filming of the something out of the blue one day, you tell me this story about my grandfather that I didn't know happened from, from my wedding. From Harold. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. I'm flying across the country by myself for the first time. But the coolest part was that it was my first manicure, and I did it with Harold. And I'll never forget. He, when the lady got to me, she was like, what do you want? I was like, I don't know, short and round? <laughs> and by the way, that's how I've been doing it for my entire life, okay? Short and round, thanks to your grandfather, Harold Zussman. But, so he sits down, and he goes short and round and i was like what does that mean and he was like son when you get a manicure you want your nails to be short and round if you're doing your toes you go straight across but if you do your fingers it's short and round that's great did he pick up the tab that day he did pick up the tab <laughs> he did. like i could have afforded a manicure right in San Francisco, of all places. Yeah, no, that was like, when you told me that, that was something I had never known of or heard before. So, that's a, like, the kinds of discoveries that I've made throughout the whole process from everybody of, um, you know, like, like I've said in other of these podcasts, of things that I thought I knew and found out that I only kind of knew. And I bet you that's what it would, would be like with all of us if we went back and really examined our family the way I did. No, it's amazing. What Can I ask, what inspired you to do this? I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll, I, actually, I do know. I have written a uh, screenplay, fictionalized, based on this whole story. And I completed the screenplay, and I started to embark upon, okay, how do I, as a first-time writer, figure out how to go getting this thing produced? <laughs> and uh, somebody in Hollywood who I was connected through to, uh, referred to through somebody, said to me, everybody in the business now they want you to have source material for these projects, which basically means write a book. And I, I did not want to write a book. So I said to the guy, I don't want to write a book. I said, I'll let if I do a documentary. And he said, 
that would work. And that's kind of what started me thinking about it. And then I put it down for a little bit, and I was watching, uh, I think it was the Screen Actors Guild Awards in 2023. And just, that was the year, uh, I remember that was the year Jennifer Coolidge won for the White Lotus uh, stuff. And she was 60-something, you know, about where I am. And talk about, uh, you know, finding herself again in the, in acting and in her career at this age. And I was like, you know what? I want to go do something with that story. And that's sort of what led me down that road. That's really cool. I actually went to college with Jennifer Coolidge, believe it. Oh, really? Let's hear that. Let's hear that one on side. Was that? Was that? She was one well, girl. Made it. She was always like that, though. Like the character in White Lotus. Like that's pretty much her. Yeah, yeah definitely. That's, you know, and that's 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 who she is, right? So it really is. Yeah, it wasn't a far stretch for her. That's for sure. No, but but still great in, in that and Legal Iguana. Yeah, what a great character actor. So, so anyway, so that's what sent me. That's what sent me off on the path. And then I started asking family members about it. And then I started doing these interviews. And what was happening throughout the interviews would would be somebody would say something extremely revealing, and then say you can't use that. And um, so what I had to do was, as I spoke to more and more people, and people started. You know, there's some people in my family still not speaking with each other, and people started slinging arrows at each other. So I I went back to people and I said, we've got to go back on camera unless you don't want to respond and and then do this again, knowing that whatever you say is good to go for for the film and so that we could get a complete picture of um, what's going on in my family. Because I think the most unique thing in the film that you find out as you uh, watch the whole thing unfold is the differences between how my family viewed itself and the business and how people like the employees and the partners and the vendors and the industry viewed my family. It was always good to see David. He took us out places, he paid for everything. It was hard not to like David. He had a, uh, he had a very much uh, charismatic attitude about things and he was always the biggest swing and stick in the room. Every time he walked in, didn't matter where it was, Everybody knew who he was, and it was just like the king has arrived. You know, my father used to say that it was built on a house of cards, um, in that management wasn't professional management outside of himself. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is I think it's a direct dichotomy between David, right, and the family, and David and the way he interacted with the employees. It was actually almost the opposite of what you would expect it to be, right? Completely. I mean, if, if think about how you would be with your children if you were in business with them. I mean, you're there to look out for them and protect them and not, not tear them down and break them down. But again, these people were, were, came from families where their parents were raised a certain way. That's what was modeled for them. That's what they modeled. That's probably what their children are modeling. But back then, they didn't talk about their feelings. They didn't talk about depression. Uh, so, right. I mean, you either lived with it or you didn't. And that's exactly what you see in the film. Yeah, it's it's really an amazing thing because you would hope and assume that once you have this, like, overwhelming international success that it would breed happiness, you know? Well, that's like you say, money doesn't care, you know? So how how did you how did do you find you, what you were doing in your delivery and the way you did things change throughout the film? Um, that's a really good question. It's interesting because some of the stuff you may recall I kind of went back and redid because having seen it in order or in progression, you know, I was like, oh, that doesn't really like the way I said it didn't really fit. So I'd have to go back and sort of make it fit a little bit more. Yeah, I think that part one was a real education process to me. So there's things that I'll do differently this time, having known and having learned what I've learned and what I know now, I can sort of speak to it with a little bit more, I don't know, I guess emotion. However, the first part was really, you know, an introduction to the whole thing. You might watch this tale and think it's the story of a once great empire brought to heel by the forces of generational shifts and attitudes. But it isn't about that. It's about family. It's about the lengths we would go to for our siblings. It's about lifting everyone else up, even at your own personal expense. So there was a sort of level delivery throughout. 
And that was intentional because you sort of had to learn the players and you sort of had to learn the context. You know, we're learning that you're doing along with the viewer at the same time. Right, right, exactly. So I started part two the other day and there was a recap. And so we sort of review what went on in part one. And it was just familiar to me. So sort of almost easier to deliver the way I wanted to deliver it because I now really fully know the story. So when I say, let's talk about this, the Meltzers, you know, it all started there, man. Let's remember, you know, so let's, let's, let's give everybody a taste of that. <laughs> and I'll play a quick clip here. Excuse okay. me. Of, um, you know, you were doing your takes over and over and over, and you could really, you could see in each take your progression, because I would say 85, 90% of the cases were using your last uh, cut. But here, let me just show that for a second, and then, and then we'll talk about it on the other side. Okay, cool. The same can be said for brother-in-law Harold's take two. The same can be said for brother-in-law Harold Sussman, husband to sister Thelma, who was then shipped off to Boston as A.L. Meltzer sought to expand Evans beyond its Midwest boundaries, taking Evans' fur salons into some of the most noted departments. Oh, I see. Taking Evans' fur salon, take two. I'm going to do the whole thing again. Fuck. The same can be said for brother-in-law Harold Sussman, husband to sister Jesus, again. Okay, so there, uh, you, you know, yeah, there you see yourself, uh, you know, running things two, three, four times. So, but what's going through your mind, and what are you learning about each little take of these things as you're doing them? Well, you know, what I learn about what's said in each paragraph has a direct correlation to the way I'm going to present it. But yeah, it does take three or four reads to get it to where you want it to be, and that's again very intentional. I give you three or four reads on everything we do. And I want you to pick the best one, but inevitably, it's always the third or fourth one that's like where I want it to be, you know? And it's very similar to what you do on the radio or what you do uh, promoting ads, you know, voicing out, oh, voiceover ads and whatnot. Sometimes it's the what the emphasis is on one word is what makes the difference. That's exactly right. And then the radio show is a little different, but certainly with the spots, even if I write the spots, I end up doing it three, four, five times, and it's always the last couple ones that are the ones that we're going to use for sure. Do you, do you know yourself when you hit a take properly? Definitely. And that's why I keep doing it. You know, I'll do it. I'll be like, uh, and I'll leave it for you, but I know I can do it better again, but there might be like one line out of five that you can take from one take and kind of put it with a third take. I know it's a little too deep. It's a little too whatever, but yeah, no, it's a, uh, you know, so I just do that. But like learning the story as we go certainly helps the delivery, because I can emote it better. Who is the shit in your family as serious as this? What's so aggravating is all these people had to do was stick together, keep making money, and figure out how to live with all this depression dripping down from Rose and Julius. But money doesn't care who has it, and once it gets introduced into the mix in a big way, all bets are off. No, I didn't. Oh, I didn't know. I thought I knew everything. I didn't know everything. So that's why the first time I kind of like was pretty straight about it, and that works because the listener or the viewer needs to learn too, so that it ends up working out, you know? Yeah, no, it'll be perfect in part two because uh, unfortunately the story doesn't get any better. So, um, you know, so you'll be able to emote that now that you kind of have a sense of what it's all about. And we actually get into some of the tragedies in this next one and, okay. uh, and as well as the fall of the business and the whole anti-fur movement and all that fun stuff. So I imagine it's gonna be quite a ride for all of us. I got to tell you, man, and, and I only know this from you, but I can't imagine what it was like for you working in Chicago, you know, having people throw blood on the doors and, you know, all that protest. It's just harsh. The hardest, you thing, the hardest thing, without giving away too much, because it'll be uh, in the next film, was when I was on the West Coast in uh, San Francisco. And, you know, and by, by the time they came in and were uh, handcuffing themselves to the to the racks and the bars and... You know, that was, that was when you'd have just about enough. And, you know, and you knew... Oh, like, three fuckers, man. <laughs> right, right. And you knew their commitment to the whole thing was much bigger than your passion for your job. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, we'll find out. We'll find out. We'll Absolutely. go through it again. Yeah. Yep, yep. So uh, tell, me, tell me what you're looking forward to uh, uh, 
delivering to these viewers and to these people in this next episode and and taking it all the way through because now you've kind of taken everybody up the roller coaster we certainly had some down moments with what happened with my sister and getting into uh, some of the downsides of david but now we're really gonna you know drop down from this uh, top of the peak that evans is at and uh, bring people some more tragedy and like i said the the, the destruction of this company m- mostly by its own internal stuff as well as by uh, this external yeah you know I, it's really important man because i feel like we literally scratched the surface on part one you gave an overall sort of view of what it was and what happened to a certain extent now we get a little deeper now we you know as Paul Harvey said, now we get to hear the rest of the story, you know? And it's important because we weren't done in part one. Definitely not. So let's review. We have Rose Walcove being sold to Julius Meltzer when still a spinster at age 29. They're coming to America first class on the backs of her wealthy Trans-Siberian Railroad engineer brothers. And this is what's interesting about it, man. There is a need for content like this. People are going to want to watch this. Absolutely. There is no question in my mind that I can see this on streaming services all across the planet. And there's no doubt. It's a great story. It's an important story. Yeah, wait. Thank you. So, uh, Michael Idles, who is the narrator of Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Art Shore, tell everybody what you're doing with yourself and where they can hear you on the uh, Shouting Fire Global Network every week and all that good stuff. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I'm always happy to promote myself. There's no problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I had left the record industry a while back, really, because there is no record industry anymore, unless you're Taylor Swift. Um, and um, I, it just kind of came full circle. I've been back in radio. Uh, I am an account executive. I am a voice talent. I do love the voice stuff. I probably do, I'd say, you know, anywhere between five and 15 spots a week between West Palm Beach and, and I'm in this Hubbard Radio voice pool, and for some reason, Minneapolis and Cincinnati really like me, which is really cool, because having grown, aside from the WBRU thing, the other thing that made me wanted to get into radio was, of course, WKRP in Cincinnati, right? So now I'm starting to do these commercials in Cincinnati, and I'm like, oh, shit, I'm living on the air in Cincinnati. It's a dream come true, man. It so, so, so what's it like? You know, we all wanted to be rock stars when we were kids, right? We all couldn't be. But being on the radio and interacting with music as a DJ is the next best thing. So what's it like when you're driving down the road and you hear yourself on the radio? It's fun. Sometimes I'm like, oh, my God, bro, you suck. But most of the time, <laughs> but most of the time it's just fun. And, you know, uh, terrestrially speaking, I'm really just doing commercials. It's really just spots, commercials, clients, whatever. Every Sunday, however, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, you can find me on Shouting Fire Radio, shoutingfire.com. It's actually the 365, 24-7 radio station for Burning Man. Now, I... Myself, prefer electricity. You'll probably never catch me creating art in the desert, but you can catch me on the air during uh, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. Eastern Time on Sundays on ShoutingFire.com. The show's called Idlis on the Mic. It's really about new music, new rock and roll, because radio doesn't play new music. Rock, there is a lot of great rock and roll out there, and it is just not getting it sp- exposed, so I'm trying to play a little part in just getting some bands out there that, that deserve the hit, you know? You know? Uh, we all, we, and by the way, for those on the West Coast, we also rerun the show because it's so damn good every Monday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. So the show's so nice, they have to run it twice. At the end of the day, we were very lucky to grow up when we did musically. 100%. 100%. It's not the same. And a lot of it has to do with niche. You know, there's no... You know, we we hear about, you know, Adele or Taylor Swift, and that's like... But for the most part, there's no real mass happening anymore. And all that, you know, it's just not that anymore. So you're right. We are very lucky to have grown up when we did. But the music is out there, and I'm going to do my best to turn everybody on to the good stuff as much as possible, including, as you know, New Tears for Fears, which is brilliant. They're great. They are great. Okay, so if you want to hear more of Michael and I talk about music. I guess we'll have to do a different podcast for that. 
He is Mo Whiteless, the narrator of Skin on Skin, the rise and fall of the world's largest furrier. I'm Scott Hunter. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We'll see you again soon.